Hi, welcome back to the show. Today I want to share some thoughts with you on a bigger plan. I think oftentimes you and I go through life and not really sure if there's a purpose or a plan to what's going on in our lives. You know, it's hard for me to, I think, look into the future. I think most of us have a hard time looking into the future. And I think sometimes you and I can't see what is possible because of maybe some stuff that's happened in the past. Let me share a story with you. Sometimes we're like this little boy who was overheard talking to himself as he strutted through the backyard. And he was wearing his baseball cap and toting a ball and a bat. He yelled, I'm the greatest hitter in the world. Then he tossed the ball in the air and swung at it and missed. Strike one, he yelled. Undaunted, you see, he picked up the ball and said again, I'm the greatest hitter in the world. He tossed the ball in the air and when he came down, he swung again and missed. Strike two. He cried. The boy then paused a moment to examine his bat and ball carefully. He, he spit in his hands and he said once more, I'm the greatest hitter in the world. And he tossed the ball up in the air and swung at it and he missed. Strike three. Wow, the boy exclaimed, I'm the greatest pitcher in the world. Tom Fetters shared that story. I wonder how many times you and I, our perspective changes when stuff happens. Let me say it again. Our perspective changes when stuff happens. There's a story in the Bible in Mark chapter 2. I'd like to share a piece of that story. It, it reminds me sometimes of the tenacity of some people to get what they really want out of life. Mark chapter 2 in the first verse. It says, when Jesus had come back to this particular town several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing a guy who was paralyzed, carried by four men. Being unable to get him in front to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down this bed or pallet with this paralyzed guy on it. In verse 5, And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the guy, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the, the religious people, they were called scribes, were sitting there and, and reasoning in their hearts. Verse 7 says, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed guy, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take up your little bed and, and go home and walk. But so that you may know that, you know, I am Jesus and has authority to forgive sins. He said to the guy, the paralyzed guy, he said, I say to you now, get up, pick up your little bed, your pallet and go home. So he says, and he got up and immediately and he picked up his, this, remember this guy was paralyzed and he picked up his little bed and in the sight of everyone. So they were all amazed saying that they have never seen anything like this before. Now, there were a lot of people, a lot of people in that house. We read the story, or just read the story to you, where there were so many people that they couldn't even get in the door because people were, were, there, were in the way. It was just jam-packed full of, of uh, people. So there had to be a choice. There had to be a, a decision made of these four friends that brought their friend, who was paralyzed, to be healed by Jesus. The, the group of people in the room... They had an agenda, didn't they? They, they wanted to see some, some wondrous event. They wanted to see Jesus do his tricks. And then the religious people, the, the scribes, as they are called back then, and the Pharisees, they were um, intimidated by what Jesus was doing for other people when the religious folk at the time, they were doing things to the people. Big difference, four versus two. That's another sermon for another day. But the four friends had an agenda that day. They decided instead of just saying their prayers for their sick friend, they decided to do something about it. I wonder how many times you and I are placed in a situation where we can maybe talk about doing something for other people instead of doing something for other people. These four men were desperate to help their friend. And then Jesus had an agenda in this story. When, it, when these four guys lowered 
the gentleman on the bed through the roof. I mean, think about this. If you pause a minute, they, if you want to be blunt about it, they destroyed a roof to get this friend to Jesus so Jesus could heal the friend. I wonder how many of us, are we desperate enough to do desperate things for the benefit of other people? I think it depends on the situation so many times. I think rather than, than sending the, the religious people away or the, or the people in the room away, uh, Jesus was determined to make a difference in this young man's life and wasn't going to allow his surroundings and or the doubters to keep him from making a difference in somebody's life. In 1 Peter, it, it talks about, you know, in the scriptures, it says that it is by God's great mercy that we have been born again. He goes on to say, now that we live with great expectation and we have this, this priceless inheritance. I mean, Peter, Peter was a guy, let me just digress momentarily. Peter was a follower of Christ. He was one of the first people that Jesus chose and said, I want you to be on my team. Now, th think about this a minute. Peter was one of the 12, you know, followers of Christ, the, the students or the apostles or whatever term you choose to use. And Peter was a guy that was a fisherman by trade. And in that culture, he was, and, and some people would say that he was a reject. He was somebody that was rejected by the religious um, scholars of the time because maybe he wasn't smart enough or maybe he didn't have the right genes to do the holy things of the religious folk. But Jesus saw the talent in Peter. And there were times, even before Jesus was put on the cross, that Jesus saw some stuff in Peter that gave Jesus a little pause. But he never gave up on Peter. In fact, Peter messed up mm, two, three, four times. And Jesus kept coming back to him and said, you know what? I get it. My paraphrase. I get it. You messed up. Let's pick up your mistakes and keep moving forward. Now, I think that if, if we're going to be um, pliable in God's hands, if we're going to be able to make a difference in people's lives, then we have to be quicker to get back up again when we fall down. I think so many of us choose to, maybe not by uh, by choice per se, but by circumstances, you just want to stay down when you're down. And I'm telling you, it is really hard to get back up when life throws you some serious curveballs. I read a story, a sailor who was shipwrecked on a, on a South Sea island, and he was seized by natives, carried shoulder high to a rude throne, and proclaimed king. At first, he enjoyed his reign, and he was an absolute monarch. But then he began to wonder what happened to the previous kings. According to their custom, the king ruled for a year. During that year, he was treated like, well, like a king. But when a king's reign ended, he was banished. He was banished to a lonely island to starve to death. Now, most people would have been so upset with this knowledge that they would either eat, drink, and be merry while they could, or just curl up and die with fear. But not this sailor. Knowing he was king for the year, he, the sailor began issuing orders. Carpenters were to make boats and farmers were to go ahead to this island and plant crops. Builders were there to build a home. And when his reign finished and he was exiled, not to a barren island, but to a paradise of plenty. I was originally told by a guy, a guy named Rick Stacy. I think if you and I can kind of see what's down the road and maybe have a little foresight to see what can happen and what might happen. Maybe we can plan accordingly to make things a little better for us. And there's all, sometimes a sense of a fulfillment when you find your place, when you find an opportunity to make a difference in somebody's life. I think sometimes, I, I, I'll just be blunt, sometimes God wants us to start where we are and do what we can every day. Again, I believe that sometimes God wants us to start where we are and do what we can every day. I read a story, it's called uh, 10 Feet at a Time. <clears throat> it says, being a provoker doesn't mean you have to be a perfect person. It means you have to be a person doing your best in the situations where you find yourself. Several years ago, after a devastating California earthquake, the news camera panned a devastated neighborhood. Houses collapsed horribly in on themselves downed power lines, and people that had been utterly shocked. 
The camera happened to spy a woman standing in the rubble of what was once her house where only a one 10 foot section of her inner wall was left standing. The woman looked at the wall where a single picture hung and she went over to the picture and straightened it out. She stepped back and, and nodded. The reporter dashed over to her and asked why she would have even bothered doing that. She said, I can't do much about all this, but right now I can clean up this 10 foot section and straighten out this picture. When others heard about what this woman did, they got provoked. Signs and banners were hung all around the neighborhood in quotes, 10 feet at a time. Everyone had a place to begin their huge task right where they were, 10 feet at a time. It was an inspiration for the whole neighborhood. She provoked others to keep trying to keep at it when otherwise they may have been overwhelmed by the job. The story ends with focus on what's in front of you. Do you really get it that life is really not about you at all? It, it, it's about other people around you. I, I don't know. There's so many ways I could explain that. But you and I have to understand that life is too short to only focus on you. Life's only too short to focus only on me. Michael Luke shared, he says, several years ago, there was a girl in an orphanage. She was unattractive and had mannerisms that were not very attractive either. And so she was disliked and shunned by the other children and was not liked by her teachers. The head of the institution looked for a reason to send her off to some other place. One afternoon, the opportunity came. She was suspected of writing unapproved, illicit notes to someone outside the institution. One of the little girls had just been reported. I, she says, I just saw a note and she, she hid it in a tree near a stone wall. The superintendent hurried to the tree and found the note. He then passed it silently to his colleague and the note read, to ever, whoever finds this, I love you. The essence, someone else who also wrote and put it on a tree outside a wall, another place. So in other words, she was just leaving a, note, a message, even though she was hated by the whole crowd. She was letting other people know that you're loved. So I'm wondering if you and I, with our own baggage from the past, with our own struggles, with our fears, with our own anxieties, with our own pain, with our own agony, with our own disappointments, that if we can't leverage all that disappointment for the benefit of somebody else, to take that pain and make it gain for somebody else. You know how hard that is to do? Because some, sometimes you just want to, you just want to stay in the pain. You just want to not wallow in it, but it, it's just hard to get out of that pain some days. I think you and I have to understand maybe, maybe that there is, there are people around you that need the lessons that you've learned through your pain. Again, there are people around you that need to learn the lessons that you've learned as you've gone through your pain. One day, a couple of church folks who were out distributing loaves of bread in a low-income housing project, they came to an apartment where they heard arguing through the door. A man opened the door and asked what they wanted. One of the, the, the church folks said, you know, can we help you? So they said, we don't want anything. We just wondered if you know someone who could use some, some loaves of bread. Why are you doing that? This is the guy who was arguing inside that apartment. He says, why are you doing that? Just to let people know that God loves them. What did you just say? The man asked rather anxiously. We were just handing out loaves of bread to let people know that God loves them. The man stared at them. I can't believe this. We just buried our three-week-old son yesterday, and now you're here at our door. The, the guests offered to pray with them, and, and the couple accepted their offer. As they were leaving and the door was being closed, they heard the husband say to his wife, See, honey, I told you God cares. We thought he wasn't paying attention to us, but he sent those people to make sure that they were. I think too many people make excuses why they can't serve. Can you bake a cake? Can, can you cook some sort of food item? Can you cut someone's grass? Can you call somebody and give them an, you know, an encouraging word? Can you donate anything of value? Can you stop along your way and give a smile? 
Can, can you take interest in somebody else's life? Sometimes it's so hard to focus on other people, like I said before, when you have your own pain, when you have your own struggles that you're dealing with. Over in the book of 1 Peter, it says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. To serve others. Life is too short to hoard and, and to keep everything for yourself because you can't take it with you. I'm telling you right now, you cannot take it with you. If you and I choose not to focus in on other people, then I think there's going to come a time when you and I may regret the fact that we haven't made a difference in somebody else's life. In fact, Peter says in the New Testament, he says to, to arm yourself with this attitude of serving others, to arm yourself, to purposely create an atmosphere in your life where you get up every day trying to think about what you can do for the benefit of other people. And sometimes in your own world, in your own work situation, in your own family situation, maybe you have struggles at home, maybe you have difficulties that you're trying to overcome. And the temptation is to focus in on what you're trying to overcome instead of leveraging what you're trying to overcome for the benefit of people around you. So I think sometimes, you know, when you come to these places, you have a, a very difficult choice to, to make. In fact, our, the, the, the scriptures tell us that we're supposed to go out of our way to make a difference in somebody else's life. In Mark chapter 1 in the Bible, it says that Jesus went into Galilee, this, this city, this town, proclaiming the good news, the time has come. He says in Luke chapter 5, he says, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. He says that, that there are times, in fact, when, when you think about Jesus and, and, and the New, New Testament, the Bible, in that culture, the regular folk would go to the religious people. In Jesus's culture, in Jesus's system, he, the religious one, went to the people. Because I know you know it, and I know I know it, that there are some people that will not walk into a church. They will not approach a religious person for a variety of reasons. I mean, I'm not going to go into all of them here. But Jesus was the type of guy that said, you know, most people won't come to us, religious folk. I'm going to go to them. And then when he did, he transformed the planet now 2,000 years later. In fact, over in, in another part of the scripture here, it says that we each have different gifts. It says, according to the grace given us. He says, if, if a man is, is gifted to prophesy, let him do it. If it's to serve, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him do it generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Again, imagine if the whole planet would understand that everybody would be so much happier if we would focus in on helping other people. To focus in on making a positive difference in other people's lives and learning from those people that you serve. Because I think some of us are maybe tempted not to reach out to help people because we think that we have to have all these degrees or we have to have, you know, all this, this schooling. But you know what? People look past that very quickly when they see that you have a heart to serve, when you really care about the people that you're trying to impact in your own life. So think about the times when you should have made a difference in, in somebody's life, but you chose not to do it. Now, some of us like me would feel and do feel regret and guilt when, you know, you had the opportunity to lend a hand, you had an opportunity to, to change somebody's life, but because of this or that, you chose not to do it. Uh, Max Lucado, he, uh, he talks about a, a, a Sunday school class about how how young people sometimes have an opportunity to serve other people, but sometimes they choose not to serve other people because of the difficulties and the, um, the, the, the intimidations that, uh, that happen with it. So he talks about this teacher who uh, had these children, they colored the picture of Jesus in, in a very unique way. 
She had taken time to rinse out and dry the empty tin cans that once held peaches or vegetables. Then they placed a few crayons in each of them and each child received their own can of crayons the color their picture of Jesus. So she only had one rule. She said to, to use what you have. So each child could only use the crayons if they can, that they receive. They can't borrow from Johnny's box or Susan's box. They could only use their, their crayons. If there was no brown or yellow or black to color Jesus' hair, or perhaps his hair could be purple this time, or, or maybe blue. If that's what, what's in your can, then use what you have, she said. Max Lucada goes on to say that she proudly displayed each picture and praised each picture as though she had just created, that they had just created a, a Rembrandt masterpiece. A Rembrandt. Each one is unique, just like you. That teacher was teaching her children through a series of examples that God has created everyone to be unique and special in his or her own way. You see, God equips each person with specific gifts and talents. And he expects us to use what we have. He gives us a, different talents and, and different gifts and a variety of colors for each child. No two, two people are exactly the same and, and each one should use what he or she has in their own unique way. So what I'm saying here is even though you think that you don't have the talents or the gifts or the, or the genes to make a difference in people's lives, I think you're wrong. Because you really have everything you need to change people's lives in your circle when you look at other people instead of yourself. Because you and I have a tendency to look at ourselves more than other people. Change that. Start looking at other people and watch your life change. I go back to what First Peter said. Each one should use whatever gift he's received to serve others. Our agenda should be about other people, not about ourselves. God doesn't expect us to give gifts that we don't have. If God prompts you or a hunch prompts you, I should say, to, to see a need, to fill a need in some form, you wouldn't have seen it if the goal wasn't to fix it. How many times haven't you driven past or walked past or ignored people around you that are hurting when you know that you had the means to help them and chose not to? I've done it. I know you've done it. Every person, as Martin Luther King said, every person must have a concern for self and feel a responsibility to discover one's mission in life. God has given each normal person a capacity to achieve some end. True, some are endowed with more talent than others, but God has left none of us without talent potential powers or creativity are within us and we have a duty to to discover these powers think about the times when you went through a certain amount of difficulty in your life and man when you were going through that difficulty you know, it was it was you didn't think that there was any lesson in that difficulty and there are people i mean there's thousands of people around the world who have leveraged their difficulty for the benefit of other people. Why can't that be you and I? Why can't that be a situation where you and I have taken the steps every single day to step out and to change the lives of people around us who, uh, frankly, would not have had the opportunity, this is kind of hard to even say, if you hadn't gone through what you went through because you would not have then been able to leverage that pain for somebody else's gain. And that's really hard to think about because you and I have to be thinking about people that are struggling around us whereby you have the medicine, you have the means, you have, you have the atmosphere, you, you have the courage, you have the love in your heart to step out and make a difference in somebody. Sometimes you're just walking across the room and then introduce yourself. And for some of us, that's a little terrifying, frankly, because some of us are really shy. So I'm asking you today to think about the people in your life, because when you and I choose to listen to the people around us, you're going to hear, they're going to hear their pain. You're going to hear their struggle. You're going to hear their story. You're going to hear the baggage that they've carried for so many years that they think that they can't get free of that baggage. You see, your dreams, your, your capacity, the amount of possibilities, your potential in you is more than you can possibly imagine. There is a bigger plan 
for your life than you can probably even imagine. So I'm asking you today to, to leverage all the stuff you've gone through. Leverage your education or lack of education. Leverage your work experience. Leverage everything about you for the benefit of other people. And then watch people blossom around you without you taking credit for anything. And it's going to change your life in a huge way. My name is John Carver, and I thank you for watching.